Um, uh, John has about uh, two years ago, one to two years ago, John started the process of uh, uh, expanding information on climate change to thousands, potentially even millions of people through Rotary International. And as they hold an international organization, uh, he joined, he, he joined as a member of uh, Climate Reality, which is Al Gore's organization. It's a, it is a national international uh, organization uh, to, to coordinate and, and uh, promote uh, actions to reduce or at least mitigate the problems with climate change. Uh, so he, um, John has been organizing presentations uh, through Rotary International and helping to coordinate uh, change, the changing uh, information associated with it dynamically. He's doing a fantastic job and I couldn't be more proud to introduce anybody uh, to, uh, to the Breakfast Club this morning to talk about um, climate, climate and climate reality. Uh, I'm a fellow co-member co of climate reality. I work in a different area of it, but I just admire what he's doing. And with that, I pass you on to John Mathers. Oh, thank you, Bert. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't get an opportunity to be able to talk about some of the other things. For instance, I just uh, found that uh, uh, a dear friend of mine who has right, got 300 of her staff stuck in Kabul. And so there's a lot going on right now. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend some time talking to you about the climate crisis at the tipping point. Um, and I'm going to do this as fast as I can, but I may uh, go over uh, 8.30. I hope that's not going to be a problem. There's a lot of information that I'm going to put in the chat at the end, uh, uh, links to various different resources. Um, but uh, I want to make sure that you understand um, who I am. And I'm lucky enough to be named after my grandfather and my great, great uncle, George Bird Grinnell. And if you don't know who he was, he was the founder of the Audubon Society and the father of Great Glacier National Park. And he inspired me, along with many others, through the Boone and Crockett Club he founded with Teddy Roosevelt. So it's not surprising that uh, environment has been always a big part of my life. And Grinnell had a glacier named after him in Glacier National Park. And it was beautiful. Here it is in 1920 and, 19, and 2013. And here it is more recently. Clearly something's missing. At one point, the glacier went almost all the way down to that lowest lake. So if you ask me why I'm focused on addressing climate change, I want my kids and their kids to have a world that's not threatened with extinction. So we're gonna get into it. Please make sure that you're muted. Um, and I know that a lot of you are very aware of this crisis, which is all around us. But I want to review a few of what's uh, the things that are going on right now and then focus on what we can do individually and together to make a difference. So this is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us ever saw. It was taken in the last Apollo mission and it changed the way that humanity thought about our common home. It's called the Blue Marble. And it reminds us that we're all connected and that our actions have an impact on our planet. But let me be very clear, our blue marble, our mother earth, is compensating perfectly to sustain herself. Every change in our climate and environment happens within her perfect equilibrium. She's been in balance for millions of years and she'll continue to be for millions to come. So what's the problem? Perhaps we, the human beings, are the ones that are out of balance and we, not our mother, are at an existential tipping point where we may lose the ability to recover. Here's where we are now. Do you know that in Siberia on the 22nd of July, it was 118 degrees at the Arctic Circle. And now right now, the fires that are happening in Siberia are 2,500 miles wide. Smoke is covering the North Pole for the first time in recorded history. July was the hottest month in recorded history. We see it in the headlines and on TV every day all around us. Bucky Fuller was right. We need to see our fate as interlinked, not as separate. 
We're putting 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every single day. That pollution, especially carbon dioxide, is building up and it's trapping heat. We're stuck in this feedback loop. Temperatures rise, heat is trapped, temperatures rise. We need to stop the loop. We need to reverse the feedback and restore our world. The Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg had a virtual uh, meeting not too long ago. Um, they, it was under the auspices of the climate emergency, feedback loops. It's worth checking out, and I'll put that in the chat later. And we know what the sources are of this human-caused global warming, including power production, agriculture, land use, industry, transportation, buildings. But it's important to understand that we're headed to a four degrees Celsius by 2100. That's 63 degrees Fahrenheit as an average. What's really interesting to me is that a five degree difference in Fahrenheit is one on the lower side, it's an ice age. On the upper side, it's overwhelming flooding. And that's not normal. We're seeing uh, an incredible amount of uh, as est estimates of flooding in New York City uh, at two degrees Celsius, that's $100 billion. In Tokyo, to mitigate it, it's 160 billion. In Rio, we're talking about mitigation at 150 billion. In London, mitigation, even with their dikes, at $300 billion. Can we afford to pay for the mitigation and deal with displaced people? Here's a few of the cities that are just beginning to deal with the issue. Now, they have high levels of population. When the sea levels rise, where are the people going to go? And who's going to bear the cost? As I said, it's all around us. Drought, storms, flooding, fires, ocean acidification, extinction events. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported uh, last week in preparation for COP26. And they came out with some incredibly uh, issues in the 4,000 page uh, report. Challenges are systemic, woven into the very fabric of daily life. Those least responsible for global crisis will suffer disproportionately. The worst is yet to come, affecting our children and grandchildren's lives much more than our own. Life on earth can recover from a drastic climate shift by evolving into new species and creating new ecosystems. Humans cannot. As I said, we have to make choices now. Business as usual, letting the chips fall where they may, or transition to a sustainable world. The IPC report, PCC report clearly shows that we have not and are not moving fast enough. And it's mostly due to personal economic considerations. We see that this is in our own lives, but we definitely see this in the actions of countries who signed on to the Paris Accord and committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. Here's how we're doing. The US made a recent commitment to 50% reduction by 2030, but other countries are failing to meet the Paris Accord targets by a lot. The first 75 that reported on their target of 45% by 2030, came in and said they'll actually reach 0.5%. And 82 countries have not reported at all as of this month. And that represents a huge portion of the advanced world. The culprit continues to be fossil fuels. Here's today's global energy consumption and renewables and environmental, they sound great, but they're a very small part of the solutions. And here we are still going in the wrong direction. In 2000, fossil fuels, and here it is 2019. And you can expect that 20% of energy will come from fossil fuels in 2080. And we're expecting the next few years to have four times more investment in fossil fuels than renewables. And here it is on a global basis, looking at the subsidies that are given to fossil fuels, currently around $6 trillion globally, while renewables are getting one-sixth of that. Perhaps we don't understand the situation. It's like an overflowing tub. 
we have to do more than just turn off the faucet. That's the net zero of the Paris Accord. That's we need to mitigate, aggressively address the crisis as they arrive. We need to adapt, find ways to live within the shifting environment. But we also must empty the tub. The current unsustainable CO2 level at 470 parts per million to below 300. That means restoration, bringing down CO2 levels through land and ocean sinks, natural sequestration. We can't count on technology. We need to change the way we use the land and the way in which we live. All three areas have to be addressed. And we know we need to change and change is possible. We have the resources and the know-how, solar, wind, nuclear, but we do we have the commitment. Did you know that the earth every hour um, uh, receives enough solar energy to manage the world's needs for a full year? And did you know that globally, wind could supply worldwide electric consumption 40 times over? And did you know that countries are part of a grid that is providing electricity that is pollution free? It's called nuclear. And it's safe. Some of the new systems that are being promoted by Bill Gates and others can deliver 4 million times the energy of coal or gas without producing greenhouse gases. We've got a ways to go to build these kinds of systems, but it's happening. And the storage of waste represents the equivalent of a small building in the United States for all the, the uh, um, nuclear waste that has been produced since we went nuclear many years ago. And all the costs are of existing renewable technologies are falling rapidly. And we're beginning to listen to nature on how to restore the planet by sequestering carbon through better management of our forests, replenishing our farmland and coastlands. Did you know that Bill Gates is the largest farm owner in the US? Did you know that most powerful sequestration results from coastal trees and kelp forests? Did you know that the Amazon basin has moved from a carbon sink to a carbon producer due to deforestation and grazing? At the same time, we're inventing and enhancing new methods for capturing carbon and sequestering it. So the question is, are we willing to transition to a sustainable world? There are three steps to make the transition. I talked about mitigation, adapt, restore. We need to accept where we are and take action. We need to shift subsidies, move quickly to support renewables and find ways, perhaps taxation, to make investment in fossil fuels less attractive. And we need the hardest part of it, which is to establish a renewable environment, concurrently creating a sustainable lifestyle. And I'll talk about that a little later. We don't need to talk about the first one, but we do need to consider all of the suggestions on how to subsidize and tax carbon. The International Monetary Fund is able to limit emissions through cap and trade. Government sets limits and companies trade the offsets of their carbon footprint or make money from the green status or simply tax carbon based on pollution. California in 2013 instituted a carbon tax and emission and emissions have declined 8%. Today, the program manages 85% of the carbon pollution, which is the most of any policy in the world. But the system has plenty of slack due to low prices and high levels of pollution permits. Here's the issue. The average cost uh, of is $2 per ton, whereas according to all the sources, it should be, and I am the IMF, agrees to this, it should be more like $35 a ton. Right now, Colorado is charging $47 a ton in their program. So many states are committed to reducing emissions. 24, representing over half the American people, are already farther than is required by the Paris Accord. California in, uh, is going after a target of 2030 rather than 2050. Bringing it in close is what the governor called it. And there are cities all over that are taking action uh, on going 100% renewable. And even though small, there are a few that are already arrived. And hundreds of companies 
some of the biggest in the world are pledged to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. And the American people want change. 70% want to move to 100% renewable electricity. And we're not moving fast enough. We must develop the political will to set the rules of the road for emitters through standards and hold polluters to account. 73% of US CFOs believe sustainable world is economically viable and required. But we cannot do this unless we shift our thinking. Right now, there's a wonderful study that has been done over the last six years by the Yale University on perceptions. And here's what they've said. If you look at the darker brown areas, that means more acceptance, the lighter areas less, and the darker blues, very, very few uh, and supportive. So here's climate change is happening, 72%, but look at the middle of the country. And here's caused by humans, 55%, and look at the middle of the country. Will harm me personally, 43%. But it's interesting to note that People um, in certain areas believe that there will be harm. Harm future generations. Yes, we believe that. We need to regulate CO2, 75%. Congress needs to do more, 60%. Citizens can do more, 64%. Now, the issue, the issue that I want to get at is the fact that those studies have been going on for six years and the numbers have changed very little. We need to balance the demand for nature, our blue marble, and our support for humankind with rethinking appropriate growth. But how do you overcome our cultural and social instincts to focus on act, to start fo stop focusing on acquisition, ownership, and disposal that is killing our environment? Is there a sustainable model that includes nature, people, prosperity, and working together? The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals might provide our roadmap, but it requires individual commitment. And there are actions being taken. There's a lot of demonstrations. People are making demands at the ballot box. But there are four actions you might consider taking. Number one, commit. Join the growing number of groups and individuals who have made a commitment to addressing the climate crisis. The Global Climate Pledge has over 275,000 commitments representing 1.3 billion people who have made the pledge through their website. There's, they're our partner in this process. Show your commitment. I'll share the link, as I said, uh, in the other resources uh, afterwards. Second, advocate. You're powerful. You can make a difference in your world. Review the results of your community's clean energy plan. And if there isn't one, help build it. And then take action to support the county plan and then go beyond. Consider joining an action team to support specific legislation. By the way, if your voice is gonna be heard, it requires you to take some kind of legislative action. The Citizens Climate Lobby is in the forefront of legislative action to address pollution in the United States. And there's plenty of others that may also fit your, fit your needs. Take action with them. And third, take on specific projects. Consider the data and ideas from Project Drawdown. It's a coalition of scientists, researchers, and advisors from all over the world with a goal of providing 100 solutions to reverse global warming. Buy the Drawdown book, download the free Drawdown review, and identify projects that may be interesting to you and that would can be addressed in your community, either through a group or by you joining a group that is doing something about it. And fourth, consider your lifestyle. Start by taking a short or a long form carbon footprint assessment. The best short form is the gold standard, Bright Action does an excellent and detailed assessment. If you go in and put your zip code in, it'll access your local assessment and have potentially 50 to 75 suggestions on things that you can do in your home, at work, and in your community. And speaking of lifestyle, have you considered the impact of grazing 
and beef production on our climate. If all the cattle in the world uh, were a country, they'd be the third biggest producer of greenhouse gases. We're seeing the impact of grazing in the Amazon, where we now have more methane being produced <clears throat> from the grazing, and the carbon sink that used to be the Amazon is now a producer. And methane, by the way, is 80 times more toxic than uh, fossil fuels. At the same time, your business and organization can seek green certification based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There is a myriad of green certification programs in almost every county and US state. And if you don't know what the one the best is for your area, just simply look it up. And again, I'll put all of these in the chat afterwards. And consider being more responsible when you travel, whether for business or pleasure, from who you're, you book with, how you offset your footprint, and where the money you spend ends up. Whatever we do, we must shift our thinking and our actions. We can overcome our resistance to change by deciding where to focus. Life as usual, economic growth with mitigation and adaptation, if we can do it, or setting standards and investing in solutions and focusing on an equitable lifestyle, and accountability. If we focus on equity, lifestyle, and accountability, it means the need to consider adapting to the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, addressing global inequities through efforts like the Assisi Manifesto, and the recent papal encyclical devoted to inequity and balance and thoughtful growth. No matter what you, we do, we've got to support legislation in the near term. So please use your voice, your vote, your choices in the marketplace. Speak truth to power like your world depends on it. Because your world depends on it. As I said, I'll put all the chat, uh, the links in the chat. But if you've got questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you, John. Um, and I'm only three minutes over. You actually, that was great, and I love the graphics. I thought that was really useful information. Now I have a question for you. Okay, so I just came back from Hawaii, and I think you had mentioned this last week. But how do you offset your travel? You know, and your carbon footprint. What's the what's the process? Well, I put the I'll put in the chat right now um, to everybody all of the uh, resources. If I can, maybe I can't. Maybe I need to send it to you because it's too much to put in the chat. Um, what you can do is you can go to TerraPass and uh, they provide you with a, uh, uh, you provide them with the information about where you went, uh, where you stayed, uh, how long you were there, whether you rented a car, and uh, uh, then you can offset it. Uh, they invest in a number of different uh, programs, including uh, reforestation. Um, but all of those links, I will send them to you, uh, Craig, and then you can decide what you want to do with it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's open it up for some other questions. Do we have any hands? I see Hetty's hands up. Hetty, why don't you go first? Oh, John, uh, would it be possible to put the information that you think is relevant via an email to everyone so we can have the, all the links in one email and we can look them up and act accordingly instead of the chat because the chat will disappear. Right. So perhaps we'll put in the bulletin. We'll put the whole thing in the bulletin for everybody too. To I'll address. send it. I'll right. send it. I'll send it to Pete. Okay. Thank you. Was that it? That's it. Oh, okay. That's it. Um, Arlen, you're up next, and then I see Alan's hands up. It um, seems to me, uh, to me, that the number one problem in the world is we just got too many people in the world, and we just keep producing people who use up resources. And I just wonder whether uh, population control is going to be a pro problem or an issue. Well, population control is always going to be an issue, um, but that isn't 
necessarily what's causing the problems that we're having. Um, this started uh, a century ago and has been exacerbated extremely in the last 20 to 40 years. So uh, yes, population control is an issue. There's also a wonderful study that was done by the Gates Foundation that identified that uh, we would even out uh, our population and be able to manage it on a global basis if we provided education, clean water and electricity um, around the world. It was accessible to everybody. Um, the education issue was focused on women. If women had the opportunity in uh, less advanced countries, uh, they would make sure that we, that we uh, actually balanced out the population. Because you have religious problems with that too. Mostly it has to do with wanting to make sure you get children. So you have four because only two will survive. That type of thing. Right. All right. Um, next is, uh, let's see, Alan. And then I see James hand, James Stewart's hands up. Alan. Hi, John. Uh, I've hey, several comments and actually would have more if I had like three hours to talk to you about this, but a couple of comments. One, it's my understanding that under the Paris Accords, um, countries like China and India, which are probably the biggest polluters in the world, uh, really have, have to do nothing until 2030. And between now and 2030, most of the um, uh, problems in, and accords in Paris are, are dumped on the United States. Now we have people like China who are building hundreds of coal plants a year my understanding, just polluting the shit out of, out of the world. And the world is doing nothing to enforce those countries to do it. My next point is here in the US, your, um, or the environmental movement has some very irresponsible spokespeople like um, AOC who run around scaring the shit out of everybody saying that there's 10, 10 to 12 years left in the planet and we're all gonna die. That's very irresponsible, especially for the younger generation believing this. And one of the um, fallouts of that is they're stopping to have children in this country because they have fear that their children aren't going to be able to survive. Now, my last point is, and my question for you is this. Um, many people, in, especially in the U.S., who um, are environmentalists and believe in all this uh, net neutrality and whatever are also the largest and most vocal opponents of nuclear energy. We have not built a nuclear plant since a Three Mile Island, I believe. It is by far probably the cleanest and most efficient fuel that we could use. And why isn't anybody in your movement uh, advocating throughout the US and insisting that we build some nuclear plants? Well, um, I, yeah, you may be speaking to someone else, but my feeling is that if we're planning on actually addressing this crisis, nuclear is the answer. I agree. Um, there are, they have developed and are developing pocket nuclear plants that are safer, um, more easily managed, and much easier to build. And if what happens is we're able to recognize that value, um, we can actually um, adjust our electric grid to be able to provide the level of electricity that's necessary for a renewable world, a sustainable world, but at the same time, um, be able to deal with the building that's required. If what we have to do is we have to put up um, solar panels and wind farms, um, the cost of doing that and the time it will take uh, is prohibitive. Not, so, to mention, not to mention the amount of land they need to- yeah, Correct. Yeah. But my, my point being is we need to we need to use all our resources to address this crisis um, why, and we need why, to do it in a short period of time. What, then why would we be shutting down the one nuclear plant we have in California? I, I'm not I don't I have no idea. And that, that's not a, an area of focus. I'm really interested in the pocket nuclear plants. All right. Um, thanks, John. And then um, I see, uh, let's see Susan Rowan's hands up. Oh, hold on a second. I'm sorry, Susan. Um, James Stewart was up next, so let's let James go, and then you can you can follow James. John, excuse me, John. I want to hear from you uh, what you think 
uh, us as individuals, um, some of the biggest contributors are what we can do just as individuals to contribute to, uh, I guess, lower emissions. I'm guessing stop or slow down on eating beef and uh, probably change out our cars, but that I would want to hear from you. Well, uh, uh, actually, believe it or not, the thing that you can do that would have the biggest impact, I'm not sure where you live, is to uh, have all of your electricity provided by clean energy. Um, and I know that sounds really silly, but if you look at your electric bill and what you did, you went to a clean energy um, uh, organization like Marin Clean Energy, you would, you would actually reduce your bill, but you'd also be, you'd also be providing um, uh, for, uh, you know, a standard for other people. Um, beyond that, yes, it's in, it's, if you went to um, a plant-based meal once a week, uh, the impact would be dramatic. Um, that's something that everybody should be thinking about. Why? Because it addresses the biggest issue we have, which is moving to a sustainable lifestyle. Right now, um, the, car, the concept is acquire, use, throw out. And if we can't find a way of moving to a more sustainable environment, there's no possible way we're going to be able to make the changes that need to be made. And if we, as in the United States, can't be a leader and show the rest of the world that we're doing it, then the rest of the world saying, why the hell would I want to follow you? Good to know. Thank you. Do, do, the, do the footprint assessment. You'll be fascinated. Yeah. All right. Thanks, James. Uh, Susan Roan, and then Burr Hill has a question. Well, first of all, thank you for a fantastic, informative, and the best graphics I have ever seen that really make the point of what you're talking about. And I remember back in yesteryear when I was a teacher in San Francisco, and this was literally 45 years ago, one of my students' parents was working on windmill energy. So we've been trying that for a long time. But my question to you is, we seem to know what to do, but how much of the influence, including money, of the lobbyists in Washington impact the decisions that are made? Um, tremendous amount. Um, you all saw that uh, one of the lobbyists for Exxon uh, was caught on a mic um, telling the truth about um, what it is that they've been doing for the last uh, 40 years. And if you look at the ads now for BP and for other fossil fuel companies, you'll see that they're still playing the game called 1% of their focus is on, uh, but 10, 50% of their, uh, their advertising is on, we really care about the environment. Um, but they've been conning us for a long time. Um, that's the, uh, the reality. So lobbyists have a huge impact. Uh, and the idea is to say we're actually doing something when in fact what we're doing is business as usual. You know, and may um, I recommend- again, again, I just want to say Exxon uh, was forced to take on two um, environmentalists on their board. Chevron has now uh, made a commitment, 45% reduction. Um, and Shell has been forced to make 45% reduction by 2030. Um, that's not much because they're still, they're still doing an awful lot of things that um, are not supportive. Uh, they have been buying up um, leases for, uh, for um, land in Alaska and in the United States uh, at a huge amount, a huge rate. Why? Because when we finally have to buy them out, as a country, uh, they will have the leases and they'll be able to say those leases are worth something. Interesting. You know, uh, I, what I was gonna say is if anyone's interested on this further, I did ear read um, Rachel Meadows book about this and the things that go on between Russia and Houston, et cetera, no offense, Janice, I know you're from Houston, but um, it, it is really mind boggling. And if we look at who's been in power and who's been appointed and who was secretary of or whatever, and it's frightening. So that's a book that really does spell out some of the things that 
Um, I didn't know, and I'm glad I do now, but you've added to it, and I can't thank you enough. Thanks, Susan. Um, Bert Hill, and then Pete Ratto has his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of comments rather than a question, John. Uh, that I think the first thing that we need to look at, instead of worrying about Russia and China at our level, I think we should really be looking at what we can do ourselves and, and, uh, and make a plan ourselves, what we can do individually. When you get into your car, when you turn that key on, you should know how many tons of greenhouse gases you're producing. And then if it's a short trip, for instance, uh, it takes about 10, 15 minutes for, the, for your catalytic converter to go in and start filtering pollution. That's the first step with it. But just going on those short trips produces, and, and, you, and you can look up and find out how many tons of greenhouse gases per mile and so if you're driving, how many times do you need to drive when you can walk, you, you know, and take other alternatives? Think about taking public transit, taking, you know, taking alternatives where you don't need to uh, travel. Secondly, um, is, is, as John mentioned, uh, move over to vegetarianism. Uh, there, there are a lot of products that actually imitate meat very well and, and get away from the, the huge amount of toxic uh, gases that are produced by, uh, by animals. Uh, the third is um, look, at, look at the cheapest form of energy production is actually demand management by conserving your use of energy and being very careful with what you do with it. The modern technologies in electrical appliances, for instance, inductive stoves, furnaces, water is far more efficient than it is with gas, regardless of recognizing the pollution that goes with natural gas. And that means moving over and, and acting work in your community. Uh, John mentioned CCAs. That's the Marin, Marin, uh, and San Francisco is part of the is part of that CCA uh, that that will that encourages people to use only renewable in, in the generation. Be sure you're part of that because it's a voluntary sign in right now. Uh, support uh, efforts like San Francisco's effort to. Um, uh, uh, take over PG&E's infrastructure in the city because what they will do is they will help produce the plan to get off of natural gas and onto electrical fully, far more aggressively than PG&E is or is interested in doing. So these are, these are just examples of some things you can do locally. Think about what I can do rather than, rather than worrying about whoever isn't doing what their part is. Because believe me, there are major organizations that are fighting and working for international changes, but what you can do will make the real difference. And if, 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 if this grows to more and more people, then we'll naturally start meeting the goals that we say, what can I do? And start investing in that, uh, changing your power for your house, change, changing all the little things that you do to think about climate. Thank you. Craig, you're muted. Uh, Pete, you're up next. Great, uh, thanks, Craig. You know, I'm also sort of in the vein here with with Bert, and I'm, I'm making more of a comment than asking a question, John, and I'll make this kind of short, but, um, you know, one of the things that we have, I, we all look at our own world. I look at my world. My world's going to have to electrify a fleet of about 400 buses, and, 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 and we are committed to do that. We actually had determined a, a means to do that, be 100% electric on the bus side by 2032. And as we uh, got farther into it, we realized that, that we were being a little bit overly aggressive uh, when you're depending on all of the parts that must come together in order to do this. And, and so now we're saying, okay, re reasonably 2038. Um, on the electric side, a, the rail side will be there hopefully by 2024, but we're starting to find that we're having, uh, our manufacturers are having difficulty uh, getting components um, the, the, the supply chain has become a bit more tenuous and a bit more difficult, um, and, and that is delaying our conversion. Um, and as much as we don't want to, uh, you know, we're going to have to probably buy some diesel buses to get us through, you know, and we expected that when that last order of diesels was delivered, I mean, I was standing out there on the, on the, in the middle of the yard telling people, see that bus, that's the last diesel bus we're ever going to buy. Well, Pete's had to roll that back a little bit because um, 
we're going to have to unfortunately purchase more of them. And the thing is, you've got to keep the service on the street. So what do you do? You know, you can't uh, just say, well, well, we'll stop. And even though we don't know how things are going with COVID, we do think ridership will come back and we have to be prepared to, to handle it. So uh, when you look at the infrastructure costs, when you look at these, these you know, it's, it's something we all really have to work at. And, and it's more important than to just write out a decree that says you will be electrically powered by 2035, realizing that there's a whole bunch of stuff you've got to do before you will be electrically powered. So, um, you know, it's this is a, a challenge. I'm saying it's a daunting challenge, but it's one that can be met. But it's going to need um, everybody to work together here. You know, uh, uh, there are so many hurdles that we need to overcome in order to do this in a timely fashion. And, and we've got to focus on that. And uh, it goes across uh, all of our industries. It goes across manufacturing and agriculture, everything. Um, and and it is, uh, while it is daunting and challenging, I'm going to say it's not impossible, but we certainly have to make a commitment to do it and we have to continue to do it. Uh, and I certainly don't want to get sidetracked any longer. Uh, I want to be able to make that commitment to 2038, make the equipment to 2024 on the electric side for, for rail. Um, but I'm just afraid that there are uh, things that occur out of our hands that will delay us and we don't want to be delayed. Pete, uh, I just want to make sure that we understand what Bert was saying earlier is that yes, there are going to be huge issues and uh, distribution is going to be an issue. Uh, we're going, you're going to be impacted by floods, by, uh, by fires, by uh, the electrical uh, issues when you can't actually provide the, the services you need. So we have to go back to what can you do individually? If you look at your footprint and you see that I don't need to go to the store twice in one day, I can go to the store and do all my shopping once, mm -hmm. or I can go on my bicycle. You know, if what you do is you look at what you can do individually, uh, there are hundreds of things you can do that will make a difference. Um, but also, you know, what can I do in my community and who can I work with in order to do something in my community? Um, you know, it, it could be working on the coastal, um, uh, the, the drainage system so that what happens is it's natural instead of having to build a wall because the walls aren't going to work. So all of that oh, yeah. individual a action is what's required first and foremost. We have, we have uh, time for one more question, and I think Antonio White will wrap this up. So, Antonio? John, I just want to thank you so much for all the effort, uh, leadership, thoughtfulness, uh, and care that you put into this presentation, not only for us, but around the world, because I, I know you're making presentations. I saw you made one for a group that was in Spain, I think, the Rotary Network, I think, or somebody from Spain. And suddenly, you're, you're, these works are happening with climate action around the world, thanks to Rotary and thanks to folks like you who are trying to get the word out. One thing that I would love to be able to see within this presentation is the leadership activities that we're having with regards to things that are happening right now and maybe get to some stories about the people who are making a difference because as you're going through so much data, sometimes it's hard to parse through the data and communicating a personal story of people who are making a meaningful difference based upon the work that you're doing here to kind of give us some insights of what can be done. Sometimes these personal stories are really inspiring, such as the story about your grandfather, which was terrific. So I'd love to see more discussions and stories of people who are actually making a difference because I think about America, I think we don't have to worry about, we don't worry about fashion, who's doing fashion in China or who's doing music in India. America is a leader in so many different areas here. And it's not one Senator that's gonna keep us from making things happen here. We are in a leadership position here. We have the opportunity, the influence, the ability to make these meaningful changes happen here. And I'd love to talk about the leadership aspects in which we are actually making a meaningful difference. Who is making a difference right now? What are some of the projects that are working on? Who are some of the people behind it? Uh, and I just wanna say thank you for not just sitting back and letting things go through status quo, but actually getting your hands dirty, doing the heavy lifting uh, and making a meaningful difference. So thank you very much, my friend, for all your time and effort in doing this. Appreciate so, you. Antonio. If, if you go to our website, rcatnow.com, and you look under uh, projects, browse, and you'll see about 100 projects that will give you the stories that you're looking for. 
Um, and there's more. There's many, many more what people are doing. Um, it's very impressive. I mean, we have people that are cleaning rivers in South America. Um, we planted 70,000 trees uh, in, uh, to protect against desertification in uh, Africa. Um, we've got hundreds of stories. Um, but it, it's first, I would ask you, go and make the commitment to the pledge, the Global Climate Pledge. Just say, I'm committed to do something about this. Join the 1.3 billion people that are involved in that process. Um, make a difference uh, in your own life and commit to making a difference in other people's lives around this climate issue.